3,000 miles away. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth, for that prayer and for the introduction. And uh, I believe we have about a half an hour, and then there's going to be some question and answer kind of time, too. Okay, so let's let's dive right in. Um, I'm just, uh, this is just another way for you all to sort of figure out how you fit into ministry, because um, as followers of Jesus, we've all been called in a general way, for sure, to follow Jesus, to know him, to experience his love, but in a particular way as well. And I like to use this analogy um, of a puzzle. And, um, you know, my grandson, Asher, when we were visiting with you all back in July, I was amazed at how that little guy could put together puzzles. I mean, he just has this stack of puzzles at the house and he just, he just goes right through them. But, you know, I, I realize when a, when a child, when an infant begins to um, learn about puzzles, you know, have you ever watched them? They just sort of, you know, they try to try to put the pieces in and randomly they'll try to get one in. And, and I realized Asher somewhere along the way as a, as a one and a half, two year old had, had begun to look at the shape of the puzzle piece and then was able to figure out where it fit. And I think that's a good analogy for us as we think about being followers of Jesus called to minister and, and equipped and gifted in special ways with spiritual gifts and uh, with abilities and with personalities and, and all those things. And it's important for us not just to go sort of trying to figure that out by hit or miss, but I think this morning, just for a few minutes, we're going to take some time to look at that shape and see how God has uniquely fitted you and me to minister in the body of Christ. So that's the analogy that I'll, I'll have you keep in mind as we think about this fit. And, and by that, I'm also saying it takes time and we continue to explore ministry along the way and to see how we fit. But I'm going to just suggest today in our Bible study that there are three ways. And again, this is just one more grid, if you will, for you to sort of look at your life and, and see how God is, is shaping you and, and to see what that fit looks like. And I'm going to talk about formation, inspiration, and then translation. And I think, Elizabeth, you gave an outline out as well, right? Okay, so we'll follow down that outline. And uh, again, just to remind us, we've all, we have this general calling, obviously, like the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus went around and Mark 1, 14 says, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news, and he said, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. That's the general call that all of us have, to follow and to know Jesus, and that's the, that's the gospel. But there's also a particular calling, and we see that in 1 Corinthians 12. We don't have to turn there right now, but we will in a minute. And that idea of the body, not everybody's a eye, not everybody's a foot, not everybody's a hand, but we all fit together, and we fit together for the purpose of ministering to, uh, to God and to the people of God and minister the grace of God and the gospel to the lost world. So I'm going to suggest that we look at this FIT outline, F-I-T, formation, inspiration, and translation as, as three um, parts of that puzzle piece in your life and in mine. And um, I'd, I'd like to start with the word formation. And if you have your Bibles, let's go to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19 to start off with today. Galatians 4, 19. It isn't on your outline, but I, I want to start here just because this is an important place. Galatians 4. In chapter 19. And this is what Paul's, Paul's writing to the church in Galatia. He says this. He says at 419. He says, my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ has been formed is formed in you. And the word form there is the word morpho. And it means to fashion something or give it shape. Now, obviously, he's saying we're going to be formed into the image of Christ and become like Christ, as he says in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we're being transformed, metamorphosed, with ever-increasing glory into the likeness of Jesus. But I think that the idea of formation is to become like Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He, he, he was God in the flesh, but he was also ministering. 
he was ministering to people. He was, he was healing the sick. He was claiming and proclaiming the good news of the gospel. So we are being formed in that way. But I believe we were formed in, uh, with three things, and that is spiritual gifts. And I believe we're formed with uh, the natural ab abilities that God has given us. And I believe we're also formed by experiences. Let's begin with the spiritual gifts and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 and uh, verse 10 and 11. And I want to go back to verse 8, actually. And to keep in mind, we are fit for ministry and formed for ministry to be part of his body, the church. And so that's one of the, the things that, you, that we continue to deal with as a part of a body, as you as a gleanings family there. Here's what he says. Above all, verse 8, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Verse 10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. As good stewards of God's varied grace. And then he goes on to mention a few of the gifts. And obviously we find the spiritual gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, in Ephesians 4, and here we see some gifts mentioned as well in 1 Peter chapter 4. But my point here, I believe that, that Peter is saying, as each of you has received a gift, and we've all been given spiritual gifts, use it. The purpose of them is to serve one another. And the important thing is to be good stewards. That is a, a person who takes care of and is aware of and is using well uh, the gifts of God's varied, there's the word, it's different, varied grace. It's God's gifts that he uses in a varied way. So you have your, uh, Elizabeth had given you copies of this uh, spiritual gift inventory, and perhaps you've done that before, and, uh, and perhaps you, you've discovered your gifts already, and that's fine. This is just another way. Now, I, I've added a couple in this inventory, a couple of gifts, a gift of um, artistry and, and craftsmanship out of the, the book of Exodus, God's gifts that he gave to people to, to do uh, work in building the, the tabernacle. I've also included voluntary poverty in there, and you may have some questions about that, but uh, you can see also where the scriptures are if you're going to follow through on that gift. That inventory is just a way of taking a... a, 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 a uh, a look at the kind of things that you see already in your life. Now, what I found out with spiritual gifts, that there usually is generally a cluster of gifts. You may find one of those gifts is sort of rising to the top, but there will always be usually uh, several gifts that, that sort of swirl and, and gather around that one gift. That's why I suggested you list five of those top gifts and then share those with others. This is part of the process. This is just like... Uh, giving you an overview, sort of the 30,000 view of this, you're going to have to dig down into that. And I would encourage you to do that with others in your, in your spiritual family there. But um, th those spiritual gifts are sort of clustered usually. In addition to that, um, they are, are gifts. Obviously, God gives them to us uh, as a way of ministering his grace and his love to others. And those spiritual gifts are not to point to us, they are to point to God, and they are given to glorify God and build others up in the body. We see that from 1 Corinthians 12. Let's go then to 1 Corinthians 12 and uh, verses 12 to 31. I want, to, want us to look at those, uh, those words as well. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 31. I don't think I'm going to read all these verses, but I just wanted to point them out as well. You'll see the gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 and, and following all the way down through 11, but I'm going to pick up at verse 12. He says, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. 
If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. I'll, I'll stop there. We can read on to that. The, the point is each of us as followers of Jesus are given spiritual gifts and they are given to us supernaturally uh, at our, our new birth in Christ. But I believe like God also gives us abilities and talents which are, can be uh, used for, to glorify him. They are uh, what we might call part of God's common grace to people, abilities. But I believe they're also to be used for, for his glory. Part of this formation is God not only using the spiritual gifts, which are important to discern, but also the abilities we have, which uh, we can be trained to, um, to do certain things, whether that's um, trained as a nurse, as a teacher, as an engineer, um, as, a teach, uh, as, as someone who uh, works in a, in a professional way. Those natural abilities and talents can be also used as uh, uh, to glorify God and build others up. I want to brag a little bit on my, uh, my son-in-law, Jesse, there a little bit. You know, Jesse, you know, I, I don't know, Jesse, what you found your spiritual gifts are, but I'm guessing one of your spiritual gifts is the gift of helps. I, I believe Jesse just loves to help other people. And, and I appreciate that. I love that about him. But, you know, Jesse was also been trained as an engineer. And when he helps people now, part of his, his abilities, his training has been able to enhance that gift of helping. He can help to fix things. He can come alongside of people. He's, he's come into Pennsylvania here, fix a lot of things, let me tell you. And, and I've been grateful for that. But I'm grateful for his gift of help. So that's, I think that's one of, one of Jesse's gifts. And I'll brag a little bit on Elizabeth, too, because she was a teacher, you know, went to college, became a teacher. And, and I know she can teach children, and that's part of her uh, abilities or training. But I believe Elizabeth also has a gift of hospitality. And I think what she loves to do is to welcome people. And I think part of her teaching was welcoming those children into her classroom, making them feel loved, helping them to learn. I think the spiritual gift that she has is a gift of hospitality as one of them. And so I'm just using those as a, as a way to, to sort of balance. The spiritual gifts are the supernatural abilities that God places in us and he empowers by his spirit to, to make a difference in the world, to edit, glorify God, edit, build others up. Uh, the natural talents and abilities are part of God's common grace that he also uses I believe, to enhance that. You may want to think about that, talk about it. I just found it helpful in my own life to see both the talents and abilities uh, not superseding in any way the supernatural uh, gifting of, of the spirit in the spiritual gifts, but they go together. And the third part of that fit is this word experience. And turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we want to look there. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, my favorite verses in uh, Paul's letters here are to this, the church in Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2, this is what he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not by works lest anyone should boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are God's workmanship. The word is in the Greek poema, poem. It's like God's writing a, a stanza, a verse in our life at certain times of our life. You know, your experiences in life, my experiences in life have also formed me, haven't they? The, the things you've, you've lost in life. Perhaps it's grief you've gone through. Maybe it's the challenges of, of illness or, you, you know, those things form us too. And that's part of his workmanship, his work of art is his spiritual gifts 
I believe it's his is the abilities he's given us that can be enhanced by his spirit to to make a difference in sharing the gospel. But our experiences form us and and shape us so that we can look at that that little puzzle piece and see how is God fitting me for ministry. The first part is that uh, word form, formation. But the second part I want to go, and I want to be aware of our time here, is this idea of, of inspiration. The formation answers the what question. What has God equipped me for ministry to do? What? The inspiration, though, is as important. It answers the where question. Where is it that God is inspiring me to serve. The definition of this idea of inspiration, a God-given capacity to fervently attach myself to a people, a cause, an idea, an area of ministry over an extended period of time to meet a need. Now, let me say that again. That's a, that's a long sentence to define it. An inspiration is a God-given capacity to fervently attach myself to a people, a cause, an idea, an area of ministry over an extended period of time to meet a need. You see, formation is important. It's important to look at that puzzle piece and know how do I fit, but inspiration is important too. It's like Delight yourself, Psalm says, in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll place in you those desires as we desire to follow him and as we follow him. Um, we can think of, um, well, well, let me look at Matthew 7 with you, Matthew, words of Jesus, as we think about this idea of inspiration. Matthew 7 In verse 35. Okay. I'm in the wrong one there. Um, okay. So Jesus had compassion for people. I'm not sure why that reference uh, was uh, uh, wrong there. But anyway. Matthew 9. Matthew 9. Matthew 9. Maybe that's what it is. Thank you. 35. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, it was a typo. Here's what he says. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds... He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The word compassion there is the word he felt it deeply in his, in his, in his insides. And splankna is the Greek word. It's a, in his belly, he felt it. Jesus, as, as God in the flesh, was feeling compassion. He was feeling this. And what it, it took him to people. It took him to people who were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I think that's that's an example. If we jump back to the Old Testament, you can see Nehemiah. Nehemiah wept over the fact that the walls of the city were broken down and he was far away and felt this, this inspiration to, to by God to go and to make a difference in the way in which he attached himself to what God had placed in his heart to do. And that inspiration is that God-given desire that compels me to make a, di a kingdom difference in the world. Finally, let's go to Romans 15, 20. I, I want you to see what it says about the Apostle Paul, Romans 15, 20. And Paul, and... He says, thus, verse 20, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel where? He says, not where Christ has already been named. 
Paul had this passion, we know that, from his missionary journeys to go where the gospel had never been preached. You see, that wasn't Peter's passion. Peter's inspiration was to stay in Jerusalem and to continue to proclaim the gospel, right? Paul's aspiration, Paul's inspiration, his, the word is ambition. It's the word phileo. Uh, it's a combination of the word phileo, which means to love, and tome, which means to honor, to love, and, to love honor. It was his love honor to God to go where the gospel hadn't been proclaimed. That was, his, that was the God-given inspiration in the heart of Paul. We know that. We see the various missionary journeys he went on. He never lost track. He stayed connected to that inspiration. So here's my questions for you as you dig around this one, this part of the puzzle piece. What things are you involved in that cause you to lose track of time? What do you love doing? What brings you the greatest joy? What feeds your soul? And if, if I were talking to a group of your friends, what would they say you're most excited about? And you could have other questions that would help you to understand what inspires you in this, as you look at the way God has shaped you, the formation and inspiration. The formation answers the what question, what has he gifted me to be a steward of that in sharing the gospel, the good news? The inspiration is where? And you might say, well, where is right here at Gleanings for the hungry? Wonderful. That's part of the story that God is unfolding in your life, perhaps. But I think there may also be uh, a, a, um, a more specific way that God is inspiring you to make a difference in, in others. Uh, we can use uh, a variety of examples, but we'll, we'll let you just answer those questions, maybe talk to each other about that as you go on, because I want to I want to do one more yet before we turn to questions and answers, and, I, and that is uh, the T in the fit, and that is what the translation, <clears throat> the translation. In other words, how is this being translated? How has God shaped my personality to serve with others in the body of Christ? And friends there at the Gleanings family, this may be one of the important ones you want to continue to discover because I found this important in the body of Christ where I serve. The translation, the, the formation, the inspiration are important works of God in my life, but the translation is equally important. In other words, how, how has God uniquely shaped your temperament to serve in a part of a team ministry, for example? And um, I believe temperament is a, is a God-given behavioral style, we'll call it that. And uh, Jeremiah 1, 5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Psalm 139, verse 13 says, I praise you, God, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Galatians 1, 15, Paul writes, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, there was something about this, this way that God has shaped us in our personalities that are unique. And maybe you've taken some of these personality assessments over the years. I know I have. I know Tim LaHaye's spirit controlled temperaments where you'd looked at the choleric and the sanguine and the phlegmatic and the melancholy. Um, there's Gary Smalley and, and John Trent's version of that, the lion, the otter, the golden retriever, beaver. Maybe you've done that one. I know I've done that. There's the disc model uh, of dominance, influence, steadiness, or compliance. Maybe you've done some of the Enneagram I'm, I gave you a, 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 an assessment form there called the Kiersey Temperament Sorter, which is based off of the Myers-Briggs temper uh, Temperament Type Indicator. I've used that one over the years as I've counseled with people, as, I, as I've worked with the congregation, as we've uh, uh, worked at this uh, with couples getting married. It's, it's a really helpful one. And uh, if you've done that survey, I'll leave that, that to you. I think, Elizabeth, you also put a grid out, right, with those 16 uh, personal, personality types. You got that copy. So, so that could be helpful in the conversation. But let me just, just de describe this for you. The Kiersey temperament sorter gets you to the Myers-Briggs letters. And just 
to describe what this is about, I'm just gonna quickly go through these, these letters for you and what they mean. And these are on a continuum, so you should always see it that way, not, not one uh, or the other. They're usually on a continuum. So the first letters are E and I, and that is extroversion and introversion. And this helps you to know where you're gonna focus your attention. Is this on the inner world inside of me? That's the introversion or the extroversion, which is with people. Extroverts like to work with the outer world of people and things, and they prefer variety and action. And you guys, if you're an extrovert, you're energized with a lot of people around and are good at greeting people. If it's introversion, if you're an introvert, you like the inner world of concepts and ideas. And you would rather prefer time to spend alone reading, studying, meditating. And in fact, you get emotionally drained if you're around people for too long. Uh, you're careful with details. You like to work on projects for long periods of time without interruption. And you get your energy from, uh, uh, from the ideas. And that's, uh, you have to answer the question, am I more of a in extrovert or an introvert? You can take that survey. It'll give you the E or the I. The, the S and the I, excuse me, uh, is sensing or the N is intuition. And this helps you to discover how we perceive or take in information. And if you prefer uh, sensing, that involves receiving information through your five senses. If it's intuition, you gather information intuitively. And an S in this um, personality temperament, which is my personality temperament, are steady workers who like to follow established traditional ways. They love to follow systems and procedures and you reach conclusions one step at a time. And you tend to dwell on the present reality and say something like seeing is believing. The, the example in the Bible would be Thomas. Thomas was a, was an, a sensing person. He needed to, to see and touch the savior to believe when he met Jesus after the resurrection. Um, the intuition people, the N on the other hand, see things with their heads and are people who tend to be visionaries. This is Nehemiah. He's a good example of this. He saw the walls that were being built before they were built, right? And intuitive people like to solve problems and they work in bursts of energy powered by enthusiasm. They don't care as much about the systems and procedures, but would rather pursue new ideas and change. So you find yourself on a continuum on this one of how you process, how you receive and take in information, a sensing person or an intuitive person. The T and the F in this are thinking and feeling. And that third area concerns what you do with the information you take in. How do you make decisions? Thinking people uh, usually do it on the basis of logic. And the feeling people make their decisions based on personal values. And now, it doesn't mean that a feeling person doesn't think and a thinking person doesn't feel. It just means those, the way in which you tend to make decisions. A thinking person will base it on logic, will tend to um, prefer to win people over by their logic if they're trying to make a decision. They're generally not people pleasers and can minister in a team environment, even where there might be some disharmony. Feeling people make their decisions, as I said, on the basis of personal values, more aware of people's feelings. Uh, uh, they prefer to win people over through persuasion. And they, feeling types take a personal approach to decision-making and communicate with warmth and harmony. So you're, again, you're on a continuum there between that of thinking and feeling. How do you make decisions. The final one is the last area deals with how you orient to the outer world. And that's judging, not judgmental, judging, meaning uh, you like uh, a person who is, has this preference, um, not judgmental people, but you like your life planned and organized. And you take that approach to life. A P on the other hand, a perceiving person, um, you can, uh, you can adapt pretty well. You like spontaneous, you like flexible approach to life. Uh, perceiving people generally are curious about and enjoy exploring new ideas and ministries. So 
So why is this understanding of our personality important? How do we translate and serve with others? Well, first of all, it's good to be self-aware. <laughs> Learned that many years over ministry. It's good to be self-aware. It's just another way of how you relate to other people in the body as we minister together. Secondly, ministry involves working together with people who are not like us. Maybe you already understand that. But by understanding and identifying other personality types on your teams there, it will enable you to serve them better. And that's why I encourage you to, to see this as part of the fit for ministry, your, your translation. How do you translate this in the way you work with others? And thirdly, understand that people are fitted differently in the body of Christ and to not see those differences as flaws, especially when they differ from us, but instead learn to love that uniqueness. I'm going to close right now and turn to some, some questions from you guys with Colossians 3.12, bringing it full, full circle back. Here you go. Verses, uh, Colossians 3, verses 12 to 14. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, dearly loved by God, put on hearts of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another. If anyone has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other as Christ has forgiven you and over all these things, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So that's, that's your uh, takeaway here, challenge folks to uh, figure out what, how has God formed you? How is God inspiring you? And how is God translating what you are and what you are passionate about? into that ministry setting. Okay, it's uh, 12.05 and I said I'd stop there and give you a chance to give some feedback or questions and um, uh, anything you wanna say. Thank you, Dad. That uh, all of the Clemmers, we are Jays on the Myers-Briggs, which means when the time is up, we're good at keeping it to the right time. So <laughs> That's <laughs> right, you. there you go. <laughs> Thank you for sharing and- Timekeepers, right. Um, the, I didn't know if anyone had done the personality test before, so I didn't hand that out to everyone, but the orange copies, um, were up there and I can make more if anyone would like to do the Myers-Briggs, the Kiersey temperament sorter. Um, again, just see me afterwards. Yeah. Anyone have any questions? So, um, as kind of going through the spiritual gifts and the temperament and figuring out some of that, what if a person doesn't like their answers? <laughs> <laughs> or what if you, if you're answering honestly, but you say, I don't, I don't like who that person is, or I, I don't think that's who I should be. Okay. Well, if, if you're talking about it from the standpoint of, of personality, you know, I've been taking this, this Myers-Briggs for about 40 years. Always comes out the same, ESFJ. Now, and, and I think that's part of it. You know, James Dobson um, in his book about raising kids said this, he, he believes that, that personality is formed before we're born. Now it can be shaped by our circumstances. So I guess what I would say is, um, what part of that don't I like? And I may need others around me to just affirm that or say, yeah, you know what? Because it's the, the, these, that grid of those 16 personalities you have on the table in front of you are just a way to sort of take a snapshot of each other. There's positives and negatives on all those personalities. So I guess that's the point. So uh, you, you look at the pluses and, and, and the minuses and you can do a little more research online of that to see Maybe there, maybe maybe you, maybe what we're saying is we might focus more on the negatives of that personality at times. I would encourage you to look at the positives, because there are positives in that. Um, I think I was referring more to the spiritual gifts. Oh, okay. Uh, and I, you know, there's some that definitely like when I do the quiz, it I was like, oh yes, that's absolutely me, and I I feel a desire with that. But then other ones, I go, well, that says that's me, but. I want to be, you know, 
I want to be this, I want to have this gift or yeah. whatnot. Okay. Or, or oh, I get you. people who okay. have this gift seem to be valued more, or I wish I see that this is my gift. Um, but I don't feel like what I contribute with that gift is as valuable as what someone else contributes, which goes back to the scripture about hands and feet and all different parts. But yeah. let's say yeah. you really know that you're an inner ear, but you just <laughs> wish you were an eyeball or something <laughs> yeah yeah okay well <clears throat> maybe the the looking at the cluster of those five gifts and encouraging you share that with other people how they see it as well could be helpful i mean you, you may not value that gift or like it but it may have been helpful to other people in the body of christ as you use it and i think that's that's the part I would encourage. The other thing, the, these gifts, there's <clears throat> there's degrees and uh, varying in degree and kind uh, of these gifts. So <clears throat> I wouldn't minimize how small it may feel to have a certain gift versus somebody else's. I mean, they will vary in degree and kind. I mean, obviously, Billy Graham had the gift of evangelism uh, and others have the gift of evangelism. They vary in, in degree and kind. Some will have the gift of hospitality. <clears throat> uh, well, let me use the gift of mercy like a Mother Teresa, uh, you know, varying gift in kind, but others will have the gift of mercy and, and will be used to form, uh, you know, as, a, as an expression of that in the body. So, yeah, uh, look at the cluster of the gifts, maybe ask others to look in on that. Good question, good question. Hi, Pastor Jerry. Hey, Andy. How are you? I'm good. I was wondering if you could tell us a story, since it's your passion as a pastor to see um, the whole church be mobilized to minister. Uh, is there a story that's close to your heart about someone who learned their fit, and you saw them, you saw them launch yeah. in ministry? Yeah. Thanks, Andy. That's a, that's a good question. I was, I was thinking about that in regard to, um, well, just the abilities that God has given us. And that's why I, Andy, I specifically went back to the book of Exodus and saw the gift of craftsmanship and the gift of, of artistry as important gifts, I believe that God gives in the body. Because what I found sometimes with, with um, a, a few brothers in, in the church I pastored who were really gifted at, uh, at doing work with their hands, of, of uh, doing construction work, uh, helping people with their home repairs. Uh, Andy, I saw this come alive when I had one of those brothers who had taken this, this gift uh, assessment for years and couldn't find the gift that he had, but loved to just be out there making a difference with his hands in repairing somebody's home. When, when he saw that he had the gift of craftsmanship, as suddenly just the lights went off and, and he realized that God could really, had gifted him to, to serve. So he, his cluster included the gift of helps and maybe the gift of mercy, I think, as I recall. But boy, did that guy take off. And, and he, he was always first in line from then on, whenever there was an opportunity to serve. Can, can I can I help you? Do you need something built? You need something repaired? What, what can I do? And um, that's the one example that's that stands out for me, Andy. Another example I would just share is um, <clears throat> there. There was a teacher in our in our congregation I remember who who taught um, elementary education and uh, and felt like man, my gift has to be gift of teaching and 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 was sort of worn out at times when she'd come to church she went through the gift of discovery and found out she had the gift of hospitality and we we pulled her into our hospitality ministry and she worked uh, you know during the week as a teacher and could take care of kids but she became part of the hospitality ministry and that just sort of her her heart just lifted as she was welcoming people into the church so uh, that was another example of that Dad, you can't see it, but um, Jesse is outside standing by a truck and he is waiting for us to come out and pray for the truck. So All right. 
we might do one more question yep. and then we'll head out it's and time, pray for time to go out. So absolutely. Any other questions? Jill. Um, I may have misheard you, but I believe you said that you added voluntary poverty. Is that was that correct? Or I, I did in the in the uh, assessment. It wasn't wasn't unique to me. It's other. Um, uh, I have a couple of these uh, that I've used in the past uh, from First Corinthians thirteen, where he seems to be talking about the uh, the gift of of tongues and and miracles and moving mountains, and then he says, "Giving all I have to the poor." Um, I was inspired by that too with a, a brother in our congregation who was uh, a missionary to Mexico and uh, really came back and lived that way. You might call it the, just a simple life, but I think he felt a call to that. And he was inspiring to us and to uh, went on to do a lot of ministry that in, in, encouraged us all to, to follow in that way. Great. I just wanted to hear more. So thank you. Yeah, you can look at uh, 1 Corinthians 13 there. That's where that came in. And also the uh, Acts 2. I think in the uh, outline that Elizabeth included, there are some scriptures to keep following up on those gifts as well. Um, that, that gentleman, by the way, uh, went on to also start what was called the Worm Project and to, um, to do a, an amazing job over the last 10 years. He went home to be with the Lord now. But uh, uh, getting rid of intestinal parasites in children around the world with uh, raising money for this worm, worm project. It's, uh, two and a half cents a pill twice a year will eradicate a uh, worms, intestinal parasites from kids. Amazing. Is the project still going without yeah, that? Yeah, it's called the Worm Project. You can Google it if you want to learn about it. It's um, uh, partners with other organizations like the Worm Warriors and all kinds of people around the world doing what you guys are doing and feeding the, the hungry. They're doing it from the standpoint of trying to make sure that those intestinal parasites, which usually consume hundreds of pounds of food out of a child, uh, are, are eradicated as well. Yeah. Hey, it's uh, past my time now, Elizabeth. All right. <laughs> I'm a Jay. I'll let you go. <laughs> right. But uh, listen, uh, this is just the beginning. I hope uh, you guys can um, talk with each other about this and know that God has uniquely made you. And I want to just pray with you as you get ready to go out and bless that truck as well today. Heavenly Father, I thank you that uh, you have done the work, most important work of sending your son, Jesus Christ, into our world to live and to show us the kingdom of God and then to die on the cross for us, for our sins and the sins of the world and to, to rise from the grave and to be at the right hand of the Father today, interceding for us and, and filling us with your Holy Spirit that you sent to, to guide us uh, to be those people who are, are just sold out in, in the way in which we find our fit in your kingdom work. Bless this team in, at the Gleanings. Thank you for their heart for you and for others, and for the lost, for the, the hungry, for doing the ministry. Lord, I just pray you would fit them together in a in an even more powerful way and that you release through them just the, the presence of, of Jesus into the world. And uh, thank you, Lord, for each of them. And uh, may you bless their day today as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. See y'all. Blessings. All right, guys, I think uh, we're going to definitely unpack some of this in our small group time on Wednesday. So save your questions and make sure you fill out your spiritual gifts inventory to talk about that. It'll be cool, Rachel, to answer some of your question in a group and see how others might perceive your gifts and the strengths that you have. So we'll do that then. And I think for now, we'll go out and pray for the truck, whether or not the tire's fixed. Let's pray for it now. And uh, then we'll go about our day. What'd you say? Back in here. Perfect. Sounds great. All right.